Hello and welcome. Um, for the latest Movember campaign, we're holding our first ever live Facebook web chat here at UCLH. My name's Elka Tullett and I work for UCLH in communications and for the next 20 minutes, half an hour or so, I'll be talking about prostate cancer with Professor Mark Emberton, who's one of the world's leading experts here at UCLH. Hello Mark. Hello, great welcome. to be here. Thank you. I'll just run through a little bit of your CV. I'll have to read this. Um, so you're consultant urological surgeon at uh, University College London Hospitals um, and professor of interventional oncology at University College London, which is the university arm, which is just a stone's throw away from the hospitals here. And you're also clinical director of the clinical effectiveness unit at the Royal College of Surgeons in England. Now, Professor Emberton is at the forefront of research to develop new techniques to diagnose and treat prostate cancer, and he's best known for his improvements in the way we diagnose prostate cancer using innovative imaging techniques. Right, first of all, Mark, could you tell us a little bit about your roles at UCLH and also at the nearby university, UCL? How do they link? So, um, I'm what they call a clinical academic. So I'm, I'm two things. I'm, I'm, I'm a doctor that treats people, um, but uh, when I wear one hat, then I put on <laughs> another hat for the rest of the week, uh, and it's my job to, to do research and, and to develop ideas that will have some benefit uh, and address some unmet need. And I've been doing that most of my working life, actually, but for the last 10 years, it's really been directed at prostate cancer. And the first challenge, which I'm sure we'll talk about, and you've mentioned is about improving the diagnostic process. So in other words, finding men that have clinically significant prostate cancer. And more recently, we've been working a little bit more on how to improve treatments for men with prostate so cancer. So does that help the fact that obviously you have patients at the hospital, you see you've got your research, and then you've got the patients who hopefully you'll be able to get involved in clinical trials. It, it's a close link, presumably bench to bedside type of type of feeling, yeah, is it? Yeah, it completely overlaps, actually. So some clinical academics need a laboratory. I don't. My laboratory is my waiting room mm -hmm. and, and the theatre in which we work. So um, the patients are incredibly generous um, and volunteer themselves to take part in these studies. Mm. Um, and they are also our patients, and we look after them. And th at one point, um, we had a study for every single type of patient that came into the clinic. And so the two completely overlapped, which is probably the perfect way that this yes, should be. Yes, perfect. But why urology? I mean, was it just, why, why urology? Do you have a personal <laughs> reason or did you just fall into this so particular specialty? I'm glad I chose it in retrospect because it's always nice to be working in an area where there's opportunity for development. I, I was, I, I struggled to choose my specialty as, as a young doctor because I enjoyed everything I did. And it was really meeting um, a urologist called Brian Ellis, who may be watching. Oh. Um, and <laughs> Hello, who, Brian. Um, and, who, and that was in Ashford, near, near Heathrow. Uh, not the Kent Ashford, and we started working together. I was his registrar, and he was a fantastic thinker and a great motivator. And we started publishing papers together and thinking about ideas. And and he taught me the wonder of, of that discipline of being able to see patients in the morning and then come up with ideas of how to improve their care in the afternoon. And it was that really that got me interested in in prostates because that that was one of his interests. And then but why I, that particular part of the body? Why, why that and not any other cancer? I think it was more the individual. I, th I think had Brian Ellis been a heart surgeon, I would now be a so heart he surgeon. So inspiration. Yeah, and we might not be having this conversation. Okay. But, um, so I think it was, it was that. And it, you normally need some kind of role model or mentor yes. to, um, to guide you. What are the main challenges, would you say, in prostate cancer in that specialty? What? So I'm, I'm, my interest is in early prostate cancer. So I'm not going to talk about prostate cancer that has spread beyond the prostate to the bone, I think that's for another, another web, webcast. Um, I, I, my specialty is early prostate cancer, and, and there are two challenges. Uh, one is improving the diagnosis for men at risk of prostate cancer. We've historically done that very badly. I'm sure we'll go into that in more detail. And the second is getting the right treatment to the right patient. And for the last 100 years or so, that's how long we've been treating prostate cancer by, with surgery, um, we've been treating everybody roughly the same. So it's a kind of one-size-fits-all approach. Mm -hmm. So if you have prostate cancer, we treat at the organ level. We either remove it or we subject it to many days of radiotherapy. And I think we're now being able to move away from that so that we can individualise care to the person in front of us. So target it more. And 
somebody who might be watching today might say, well, what can I do? How can I prevent getting this? Is there anything I can do to prevent getting prostate cancer or no early symptoms so that I can do something about it? Or is this part of the dilemma, part of the, yeah, the, the trick? The, the only definitive preventative strategy is to have your testicles removed before puberty. And, and um, those individuals existed, they were the castrati, the singers. Um, and if you deprive the body of testosterone um, from an early age, then, then prostate cancer will not develop. That's a bit drastic. And, it, and, and I'm not recommending no, it. No, no. But the, um, and, and since that time, we, we've, we've been looking at uh, ways of prevention, uh, but nothing has really stuck. Um, there, there was one uh, attempt using a very soft hormone uh, called dutasteride that was used to see if it could prevent prostate cancer from developing. Um, and it did show a reduction in the uh, prevalence of prostate cancer, num number of prostate cancers that were diagnosed over a certain period, but that never got accepted for use. So what would you say to somebody listening to this thing? Is there a straight answer? Is, is, it, is it if you're a certain age or if you've got a genetic, possibly a genetic link? Is there anything that people could do to be more aware? Yeah, so um, it's quite clear that moving from a low-risk area, such as rural China, historically, maybe things are changing now, to, let's say, United States, uh, within one or two generations, that individual will have a doubling of his risk of prostate cancer. So there are clearly environmental issues that are at play, uh, and we've been trying to tap into those. You know, is this, is this dietary? Is it pollution? Um, is, it, um, is it the way we live our lives? Uh, and, and, and there are some aspects of that that I think are, are relevant. Mm. And also there are pockets of prostate cancer, um, po pockets in, in the world where prostate cancer seems much more prevalent and perhaps a bit more aggressive. And, and we see that in black men, for instance. Um, so um, African-American men are very high risk of prostate cancer. Uh, Western Africa is particularly high risk. Jamaica, particularly high risk. Mm. Uh, the further you move away from the equator, the risk mm. goes up a bit. Um, some of that may be related to sunlight, vitamin D, genetics. Um, at the moment, I think uh, diet probably plays an important role. So keeping thin, exercising, and probably reducing meat in terms of your diet and increasing the, ve the vegetable component uh, are probably the key most important factors. And then there are lots and lots and lots of things that people recommend um, one so is age, though, isn't it? One is, is sort of... Is yeah, age or not really there's nothing age? much you can do about your no, age, unfortunately, no, no. as yet. But yes, age is the biggest predictive factor for prostate cancer. And we know from um, studies of men that have died from other reasons, where we looked at the prostate, uh, as you age, the risk of getting prostate cancer increases. So by the time you hit 80 or 90, you're much more likely to have prostate cancer cells in your prostate than not. And so I sit here today, I'm in my mid-50s, I have a, about a 30% chance of having some prostate cancer cells in my prostate if we look at those, what we call the post-mortem studies, um, that looked at prostates in men that died of other things. But it's not, it's not bleak, as you say, is it, at all? Because, no. Because you can have prostate cancer, and, and actually it's not really clinically significant. Is, is that right? Correct, yes. correct. And, and this, so, is, this is a difficult so thing. we don't want to worry people, because actually... Correct, you yeah. can just so, so, Explain a bit more about that. And, and, and this, this is the dilemma, this is, this is the diagnostic challenge. So most of us are destined to get prostate cancer, and most of us are not going to die of that prostate cancer, but some of us will. And there are still 10,000 men in the UK each year that will die of their prostate cancer, which is roughly the same as the number of women that will die of breast cancer. And our challenge is to select out those men that are at risk of dying of prostate cancer, or that prostate cancer spreading, from those who, who can... Quietly what happened, be left alone. Yes. And, and it's this, people have used various words, um, you know, pussycat, the, the, the cancer that isn't going to progress versus the tiger, um, indolent, uh, so as the cancer that can be safely watched versus the aggressive or clinically significant cancer. And the modern dilemma um, and the perfect test would be able to discriminate between the cancers that will affect a man's quality or quantity of life and those that won't. What sort of treatment options are there open to men who have got prostate cancer that you feel do, you know, that someone does need treatment yeah. for? Um, so, and what are the challenges of that? So, as you might expect, with that range of risk, there's also quite a range of treatments. And I suppose the issue has been that we've been uncertain in our diagnostic processes as to which cancer that individual had. 
and that's this kind of notion of precision, of being right about the prediction of the risk of the individual in front of you. Um, but the range of options that a man has when he's diagnosed um, ranges from um, observation or active surveillance at the one end. So in other words, we say, we think that your prostate cancer is little or no risk to you, and therefore we will watch it. The blood tests and things like that, is yeah, it? Yeah, blood tests, um, regular examination, um, historically and in some places repeat biopsy, which is, has its own problems. We can talk about that. Um, uh, but we're slowly now using imaging, as we do in women uh, with breast cancer who will have regular mammographies, and we are doing regular MRIs. So you to keep, keep a an close eye. eye on it, and sometimes exactly. someone might need nothing at all. Do exactly. You? Um, and, and what and about for those that do need some sort of intervention? So presumably there's, there's surgery. Yep. And also, can you tell me a little bit more about the research area that you're involved Fine. in? Fine. So, um, so we've got the surveillance for the low risk cancers. Mm -hmm. In, in men that um, we feel need treatment have two principal options um, historically and they have been surgery to remove the whole prostate or radiotherapy that's administered to the prostate, usually from outside, uh, but also can be done by placing seeds inside the prostate. And there are quite a lot of developments in, in radiotherapy. We're building a, a proton unit uh, just around the corner yeah. um, and, and that's been used as well for, for, for treating prostates. Um, and print Principally, those two treatments have been used to treat men uh, who've had clinically significant disease and we treat the whole prostate. Um, and that's been the mainstay of treatment for the last 50 and indeed in surgery for the last 100 years. Um, and that would be fine if the treatments didn't have some significant side effects. Mm -hmm. And the side effects are really incontinence, so men will require pads afterwards, um, uh, and 5 or 10% of those individuals, um, and... Um, there'll be an effect on their sexual function, their ability to get maintain erections, and also to ejaculate and um, have normal sexual relations. Uh, radiotherapy tends not to affect continence, but can affect sexual function, and can also affect the rectum and the bladder, which are two structures that are very near to the prostate. So how does your area of expertise, I mean, how does that address those, those problems? So, so we're, we're, we're trying to work in the middle ground. Yeah. So um, you've got surveillance on the one hand, whole gland radical therapy on the other, yeah. and there are men that need both surveillance mm -hmm. and whole gland treatment, um, but there are also many men in the middle that have early, low volume, clinically significant prostate cancer that actually we can now see. And it's interesting that we've been managing the prostate, as I've said, for 100 years without actually being able to see the cancer. And the diagnostic process that has let us down a bit is, is the one that um, used to interrogate the prostate randomly because we didn't know where the cancer was. And of course we missed the cancers and we misclassified them. Now that we can see the cancer, we can have a conversation with a man and we can put up the MRI on the screen and we can say, that's your prostate yeah. and that's your cancer. And they go, is that all, is that all we're talking about? It's <laughs> yes. about the size of a pea. Yes. And, um, and just that process is very reassuring for many men. Yes. And then we can come up with a plan to just, treat that yeah, area. Yeah, just targets that one. And they're very happy with that because we, we, we zap that area as a day case and they go home almost with no side effects. We don't have a magic wand, we have to destroy tissue, but we can, we can preserve... We keep it to a minimum. Yeah, I mean, content's very rare and, and the majority of men will preserve sexual function. Yes. But it is, it is a new way forward. Uh, we, we've, we've got... And what's that called, that technique? Well, it's called lots of things, <laughs> uh, but I call it focal therapy. Right, OK. Or tissue selective therapy. Right. Um, and, and most of the early trials to support its safety, its acceptability, um, and now its efficacy, in other words, the degree to which it works, uh, were either initiated or done here at UCLH. OK. In the areas of research around focal therapy, have you got anything... But particularly interesting in the pipeline? Is there anything on the horizon that's uh, particularly exciting in the research field? Yeah, well, it, what's, what's been wonderful is that the, the ability to do research on the patients of North London and indeed on patients that come to us from all over the country um, has meant that, um, that many companies with interesting technologies come to us uh, from abroad mm -hmm. to conduct their research studies for them. They could go anywhere. Um, but because of our reputation and our ability to recruit quickly, uh, we, we've become a centre for such companies. And we, we just completed a phase three study. That means a 
randomized study mm -hmm. in, in which we allocate men to the experimental treatment and also to a standard of care mm -hmm. to, to look at the differences. And, and that was a big European study, um, 42 centres, which was led here from UCLH, uh, which will soon be published in, in one of the major journals. Can you journals. say what, what, what's the end result of that? It, it's very positive. Yes. So, so uh, we hit our endpoints, as they say. So when you design a study, you have to kind of predict the outcome and you either hit or miss that. So outcome. is it tweaking the existing therapy or is it a new therapy or a new way of doing it's, it? No, this is a completely new type of therapy. This ah, okay. is what we, call, we would call a new class of therapy. Mm -hmm. um, and the one in question, uh, which we did for Steba Biotech, uh, was for, for, an, for a very clever invention in which um, we inject um, a photosensitizer. So that kind of encourage, were you to go into the sun yeah. after having a photosensitizer, you would become sunburned. So right. it sensitizes your whole body to light. And the sensitizer was taken from a bacteria that lives at the bottom of the sea, and it's nature's most powerful energy converter. Right. It hardly gets any light, and yet it can live yeah. by just that little bit of light that comes down. And um, the very clever scientists at the Wiseman unit in uh, Israel um, did the chemistry um, to allow us to inject it into patients, uh, which we did in early phase studies, middle phase studies, and now in the phase three. Um, and then we shine light into the prostate, and the interaction between the sensitizer and light destroys the cells. Okay, so it's even more accurate, in other words. It is. is it? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's, wonder, it's wonderfully accurate. So if somebody wanted to join one of your trials, how, how do they go about that? What do they do? So uh, many of the urologists and oncologists around the country um, know about the studies that are up and running and could refer you. Mm -hmm. um, if you um, Also, your GP could refer you to us uh, if you have prostate cancer and you'd like to take part in a trial. Uh, we do have trials up and running. Um, prostate Cancer UK uh, tend to have a clearinghouse of all the trials that are currently recruiting in the country. Right. So okay. any, any one of those things would work. Okay, that's good. I think we'd better take a few questions now, haven't we? That's fine. I'm getting a few um, coming up. Um, right, Mike, we have touched on this actually. Are there any symptoms I should be looking out for and is there a certain age that I should start having myself checked out? I mean, you very briefly, because I mean, we have talked about this to some extent. Yeah. It's, um, it's a very good question. So there aren't any real symptoms. So um, often men confuse um, symptoms uh, with their peeing, so going more frequently, diminished stream, urgency, incomplete emptying as a sign of prostate cancer. Very rarely is that a sign of prostate cancer. And actually for the prostate cancer to interfere with the flow of your urine, it has to be very advanced. It's almost too late. Um, and so we would like to uh, diagnose men before that mm. happens. So, so that's, that's not a specific red flag signal. Right. Um, however, um, these symptoms do bring patients to their doctor and their doctor invariably refers them to urologist to deal with. And this is normally due to an enlargement of the prostate, a process we call BPH. In, in the process of looking after somebody with BPH, mm. we tend to rule out prostate cancer by doing a blood test the PSA and if so that's that elevated would, that will trigger things. Yes. And also you mentioned black guys have got a, uh, should they be more watchful in some way or if they're over yes. 50 should they go to their GP and ask for a blood test yes. as a matter of course? Or? So there, there are two risk groups really, one is, one is um, black men uh, who are overall at higher risk and, and, if we're, and at time of diagnosis they tend to have higher risk prostate cancer. And the, and the other are um, groups of families where there tends to be lots of breast cancer and ovarian cancer, uh, where there's a genetic defect mm -hmm. um, in the BRCA gene that makes that man more at risk. Those families are usually quite identifiable, and increasingly now, uh, men in those families are getting genetic testing and are coming to us right. with a positive test. And then we manage them like in the active surveillance group. So okay. we, we treat them as if, as if they had low-risk prostate cancer, and we put them into an active surveillance so they get MRIs so they virtually can. every year. Okay. Um, so now what's, let's have a look at other questions we've got. Right, Andrew wants to know, has the, I don't know what this is, but the nano knife focal therapy for prostate cancer yet become available on the NHS other than in clinical trials? Sadly not. So ah. we, we, we completed the first clinical trial of nano knife here at UCLH. Maybe I should say what it is. Yes, what is nano knife? So it's, <laughs> it's when we electrocute the prostate, or the cancer actually, within the prostate. Um, and it's used in other, in other cancers, particularly in pancreas at the moment, is where it's been very effective. It's a very clever system in that it passes 
high voltage energy, energy between two needles and we would normally put four needles around a, a small cancer and the high voltage energy blows holes in the cell membrane right. from which the cell can't recover right. and then that forces the cell to go into what we call programmed cell death or apoptosis right. um, and the cancer dies. So we don't okay. burn the cancer, we okay. force the cancer to commit suicide. Okay. Right, so but it's a very interesting process. It sounds great, but it's not available on the NHS yet? Not currently. I think, I think the only thing that can be treated with nanonife on the NHS is pancreas, um, but that does mean that at least the infrastructure is available on the NHS right. and I suspect it won't be long before the prostate okay. is included. That's good. Uh, oh, now We've got a question here from Sadiq, and this is something, again, you touched on earlier when you mentioned about breast cancer. Um, someone, he's saying, although prostate cancer is the most common male cancer, there doesn't seem to be any screening programme like there is for breast cancer, and, sure. and why is this? So this, this is a huge frustration for many people, including Sadiq, I suspect. Yeah. Um, I think, actually, it, it was the right decision, because I'm not sure we had the right tools to do a screening programme. I remember in a screening program, you're going up to people who are healthy and you're saying, you think you're healthy, but you might not be, mm -hmm. have this test. So you really want a test that works well, you know, that doesn't um, get it wrong too many times, doesn't create too much anxiety unnecessarily. And I'm not sure that PSA biopsy um, is really up to it. Right, okay. So it's not necessarily the golden bullet that's going to... No, but I think I think the, the news for Sadiq is good. Right. In in that we now have MRI. Yes. Uh, this is no radiation, widely available, relatively inexpensive. Yes. And so we have a tool now that actually is fit for purpose yeah. for screening. Yeah. And we are at the moment got a grant going in. Yes. I was writing it just yesterday, yeah. uh, where we are going to explore. We're going to seek to explore, mm -hmm. um, and we'll do if, if the grant is funded um, to see. Uh, the extent to which MRI can be used as a screening tool for men okay. such as Sadiq or, or his friends. Exciting or stuff. Okay, now Awad, I think that's, I think that's how you pronounce it, Awad, I think, is a, is a PSA value of 25 a strong indicator of prostate cancer? Yes, yes. So 25 is high, but there are other things that could be causing it. Right. So um, the individual with a PSA of 25 could have an enormous prostate. It, this would be very unusual, but they mm -hmm. exist. And if the individual had a prostate of 200 cc's, a prostate, a PSA of 25 would be normal. Right, okay. Um, equally, if that individual had just had a urine infection and somebody done a PSA, and this happens, um, the urine infection can force up the, the, the PSA. Right. So possibly, but I, not necessarily. He, if it's, if it's Awad's PSA, he needs to get checked out. Right. Um, but there are things other than prostate cancer than it could be. Okay. Martin wants to know, I've been referred to hospital because my GP is worried about raised PSA. and My local hospital doesn't do an MRI, MRI before having a biopsy. Is it important to have an MRI scan? Yes. Yes. I, I, I really think that it is. Now, like all new technology, the world isn't fair. And, and technology start in a few places and then disseminate out, and that process always takes a bit of time. Um, but I think if you have a biopsy without an MRI, you have an inferior test. Right. And so I, I would recommend that he get referred to somewhere with an MRI. That would be, that would be what I would do. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we'd Sounds be happy like to see him here if the, if the GP is happy to refer him, but there'll be other places near a home as well. But that's what I would do. Uh, I decided seven years ago that I wouldn't have a biopsy without an MRI beforehand, and that's what we've done to all our patients since. Okay. Uh, Fox says, research funded by the Movember Foundation found that men have a genetic fingerprint within their prostate cancer cells. What does that mean? Yeah, so in fact they have probably genetic fingerprints, I would argue, um, and because we've learned now that um, no, no prostate cancer is the same. And actually, within each prostate cancer, uh, we have this thing called heterogeneity. And so <laughs> it's a bit like a tree growing, and all the branches share the trunk, and that trunk could have a certain fingerprint. And then as each branch grows out, that fingerprint changes a little bit right. because the cancer evolves. Okay. And over time, the cancer changes. But obviously, if you've evolved into, let's say, cancer A, and you've also evolved into cancer B, 
A will evolve into different things than B will evolve into. Right. And then, what does that mean, though, for the person involved? Well, it, it, it's, it's, it's an important kind of... We've known about it for a long time, but I think we only really appreciate the significance of it. Um, the, the main importance of it relates to treatment with drugs and resistance to treatment with drugs. So, in other words, if you're treating a cancer that you think is the same, you might just pluck a drug off the shelf that would right. deal with that. But if a cancer is different everywhere, there might be elements of that cancer that can survive your drug or your radiotherapy. So it all goes back to more targeted treatments? Isn't Correct. It? Ah, okay. So you're really trying to, what kind of Correct. cancer is this? Correct. And then you're halfway yeah. there, perhaps. But, but it's, I think the more we learn, the more complicated it becomes. Mm. Um, this is less relevant to surgery, because if we're destroying everything or removing everything... Yeah there doesn't appear to be resistance to that. Obviously, there'll be elements of the cancer that may have a greater risk of spread yeah. than other ones. Um, but are you generally optimistic in terms of... It sounds like you've got lots of exciting research in, you know, in, in the offing. Um, do you think it looks quite bright for, for men who have been diagnosed with prostate oh, cancer? Without question. I think we're, we're at the threshold of a major revolution um, in, in the way that we understand the disease in, in early prostate cancer. And, and, and it, it is extraordinary to think that we've been treating it for so long without being able to see it. And being able to see it now and measure it uh, really is, uh, allows us to think completely differently mm -hmm. about the disease. And, and, and the big revolution is, is this thing called precision. So in other words, 20, 10, 20 years ago when I was diagnosing men with prostate cancer, I, I really had no clue as to the real nature of the cancer within that man's prostate. And therefore the tendency was to throw the book at him, treat him with everything we had available. And that meant that a lot of people had treatment unnecessarily. Today, uh, we know with great precision what's inside the prostate. Uh, we can see it, we biopsy it several times, we subject it to lots of interesting genetic tests, get some fingerprints off it, yes. um, and, and then can tailor treatment not only to the individual, not only to the prostate, yes. but also the cancer within it. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, it's brilliant. Well, thank you for all your questions. Um, I'm sorry we haven't been able to answer them all, but uh, maybe you can come back and answer them another time. I'd be delighted. Yeah? Um, if you could give one take-home message today to anybody who might be listening, what would it be? So the, the revolution is, is imaging, um, and, and it's that that is going to change everything forever. And amazingly, for any technological develop, it's going to improve all the aspects of care that we've talked about and some that we haven't. Right, so some improvements improve things a little bit, but actually imaging improves everything uh, in terms of the diagnosis and treatment of prostate cancer. Is there anything, I mean obviously it's a, it's a very big subject, but is there anything that we might have missed out that you really want to say to people that... No, um, I, I think we covered all the issues that, that, um, that, that I think men out there and, and their carers and loved ones <laughs> need to know about. But we'd be delighted to um, get some feedback and see if any... any any further sessions such as this would be valued. Yes, and you can also check out our website for urological cancer at www.uclh.nhs.uk forward slash urological cancers. And also remember to check out the Movember campaign because that's very interesting about this and other aspects of men's health at uk.movember.com. Uh, so thank you very much for tuning in. I hope you found it useful and please do let us know how you found it because we'd like to have other web chats in the future and perhaps you can come along then. Delighted. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.